If you're a somewhat new game developer or you're just considering getting started with game development, it can be a scary thing. Because let's be honest, you probably are like, I want to make game, but there's so many things where you're like, I'm not sure about how this works. I mean, if that wasn't the case, this YouTube channel wouldn't exist and we wouldn't get any views. So I'm assuming that you have some questions about game development. And I made a video about this before where I talked about some game dev misconceptions, but you guys really loved it. So here are five more game development misconceptions that I didn't cover in that first one. And the first one that I just want to really destroy is that one, you need a publisher and two, having a publisher will automatically guarantee your game being good. We've talked about this before where no, a publisher is not going to give you $100,000 for just pitching a game design document and anyone telling you that that is the case has not been up to date with the current games industry. But also it can be kind of a trap to glorify all publishers as these all-knowing and all-seeing games marketing and games development people who will make sure that your game gets tens of thousands of wish lists, that it will just be successful. Yes, you'll get money, which is nice, but there's a lot of caveats that come with it as well. And we keep in mind that a lot of publishers, speaking from experience, from talking to other game developers in the industry, aren't always the best. Sometimes publishers disappear overnight. Even publishers that are like humble games, they are pretty big, right? And then suddenly, nope, they're gone. So right now, especially, publishers are very much not always the way to go. Now, don't get me wrong. If you can have the opportunity to have a publisher and it passes the vibe check and you think that, hey, this is actually going to help my game, that is good and go with that publisher, but don't hold back because you're waiting for a publisher to respond to your emails with your pitch deck and just fund the entire process. That is unfortunately not how it's going to go anymore. So get started on making your own games. I've made a video before that's just like the ultimate guide to self-publishing your game where I talk about, hey, where do you get the money? Where do you get the marketing? Where do you get the validation and all of that? It's a really good video. So if you are interested in, hey, maybe there's not gonna be a publisher for me or I just wanna make my game without a publisher, that is a video that should help you a lot. A second misconception or like mistake kind of thing that I see developers make when they have actually developed somewhat of a game and they're submitting to game jams, submitting it to like Steam demos or just getting people to play test it is once again twofold. Either they treat every single piece of feedback as like super valid and they will listen to it and immediately change the entire game or they will be like, hey, this is not the vibe that I wanted to go with this piece of feedback. Like any feedback that is not mine is kind of invalid. Both of these approaches aren't good. So the problem you get with that first one where you take every piece of feedback at face value and immediately try to solve it is that you need to remember there are so many people out there who play games. There are so many people who have their own preferences. And if you're going to listen to everyone, you're going to end up with a game that you personally don't like anymore because you're going to be making a game for someone else. And it's also not going to be for just one person, but it's like 10 different people who all add their own little thing that it's just not going to work anymore. You as the game developer and game designer still have the privilege and the right to just go like, hey, this piece of feedback, Fuck it, this is not the vibe I wanted to go with. When we were showcasing and playtesting Forge Industry, there were like people who came up to us on our like boot at Game Force and were like, hey, you know, I know what will make this game great. It's multiplayer and like a PvP Battle Royale style mode. And it's like, no, that's not going to be it because that's not what we want. Maybe it's what some people want, but don't bother listening to everything. On the other hand, it can be very easy to just shut your ears and not listen to any feedback and just keep working on your game. This is very easily done by simply never playtesting your game, which is also a bad idea. You still need to get other people to try out your game, to give feedback on it and figure out, hey, which pieces of feedback are actually valid criticisms that I should address before I release my game. And honestly, the easiest way in my opinion is to take every single piece of feedback you get and extract like what is the core issue? Is it bad controls? Is it bad UI? Is it unclear gameplay? Is it not fun? Whatever. And kind of just track those and see like, hey, 10 people are saying that the UI is bad, but only one person was like, yeah, you need to add multiplayer support to this game. Well, probably you should actually take another look at your UI, but for multiplayer, like if it's just one person or just a few people, like percentually for all the pieces of feedback you got, it doesn't matter that much. So really look more at, okay, what are the global trends? Don't look at just a single piece of feedback. Like sometimes people have good suggestions, but still don't immediately implement them all. And then once the feedback storm has calmed down a little bit, take your time, go through all of the feedback and see what are the general trends and only fix those. 
The next one is one that shout out to all of my other fellow game dev YouTubers who are like, hey, I sold my house and I am going full time on making my game is giving that idea that, hey, the only way to be successful with game development and also kind of shout out to me is by quitting your job and going full time into game development. And the answer to this is it's simply not true. I think it's kind of dumb to quit your job and go full time into game development. I have done it and I still think it was dumb. I just didn't like my job and I had this YouTube channel which was like very slowly starting to start. I still am uncertain if I would take that same decision again. A lot of people that I talk to have that same thing. There's a lot of survivorship bias where, yeah, you have the developers of like little company and whatever who can quit their job and go full time now. But especially those first few games you're making, please, for the love of God, do not quit your job. I think you're much better off especially just getting started with game development without the impending doom of running out of money. Because once again, publishing, probably not going to happen, especially not for your first games, keep that in mind. And you just need time to figure all of these things out. Quitting your job is not going to be the secret recipe to having a good game. No matter what anyone tells you on the internet, don't do it. Only do it if you actually have already gotten that publisher lined up, for example. If you know that, hey, I have enough runway for my suggestion is at least two years, which is two years where you could earn literally zero dollars and you would be fine with that. It wouldn't be, oh, stressful. No, you could still live comfortably and not have to like cut back too much on expenses, eat only beans and toast or whatever for two years. Only if you are like, hey, I can afford that. That is when I would suggest, hey, maybe you can look into this game dev thing more full time. If you already have a few games that are already released and that maybe are earning you some passive revenue, then once again, the decision is a bit different. But in general, I really don't suggest quitting your job to go into full-time game development, especially in the beginning. And you really don't even need to do that to have success with game development. And one misconception that is tied to this, hey, don't quit your job, is I can do everything myself. This is a very common one that I see often where developers are like, okay, I'm gonna start making my games, I'm so hyped, I'm so pumped, I got my game design document, I'm gonna work like 70 hours a week or whatever on my game and it's going to be awesome. And they want to do everything, they want to do coding, they want to do the art, they want to do all of it and even if they are skilled, it's not going to work out most likely. Because over three quarters of indie game developers are solo developers and even if you had 80 hour weeks for like a year on end, there is simply too much that needs to be done to make a game. Games are incredibly complex. You have no clue how many different parts there are. The music, the sound effects, the game design, the programming, the marketing, the art, the modeling, all of that stuff. And first of all, you're probably not an expert in all of it. And second of all, even if you are, it's going to take longer than you think. So there are two main tips here. Either find like what we had, find some more people you can work on your game with. I know it's not always that easy. Or if you can't find someone else, see if you can outsource things by using asset packs, for example. Music is one of those things that if there's any composers watching, I'm sorry but it's just not worth spending time or money on music often to get like custom things made for your game. Chances are you're making a game that you can use some pre-made music for. And is it going to be 100% perfect and completely tuned to the game you're making? No, but it's also gonna save you months of learning how do I make music and also a whole bunch of money. Composers can cost a lot of money. Like if you go for the very cheap ones in like third world countries, you're still looking at often 80 to 100 dollars per minute of composed music. When you go to more Western countries, it's like 250 to 500 to even I've had quotes of 800 dollars per minute of music. No, that does not work. That's too much money. But getting some asset packs on things like Humble Bundle are a great way instead to spend like 30 dollars, for example. Or even if you want to go like Unity Asset Store has some for like 100 dollars or whatever, which are like more expensive and like a bit higher quality maybe that is going to save you so much time and it's going to be the better move at the end of the day. And then this last misconception is a bit of a doomer statement that I hear from people who are tuned into the news and are like, hey, I've been following game development, but there's no way I'm gonna make it right because Triple Indie, Double AA, A, Triple A, like all major game studios basically are doing layoffs. Every week there's like five studios that close down or they like fire a whole bunch of people. If those big studios can't keep the lights on, then how could I, a poor indie with no prior experience, with maybe no game dev related degree or anything, I'm just a programmer who wants to make games at the end of the day, how can I compete with that? How can I survive? And the answer is kind of, well, you don't always, that's part of the risk. That's also why I'm like, don't quit your job. On the other hand, you also need to keep in mind that 
indies and AAA studios, you cannot compare them because there's just so many differences in how much games will actually cost, total cost to make, how many teams. The more people work on a game, the more overhead you have as well for management, for producing and all of that stuff. And it's also we, like, triple-A game dev, so to say, kind of got into this dead spiral. Every game has to be bigger and we've got quadruple-A games and all of that. And there's just no demand for that because people don't want to spend 80 euros on a game. But if they don't, well, then those studios simply can't afford to keep making those games. And this is where indie development actually has gotten a bit of a renaissance. Well, not a renaissance, but it's gotten more popular again. It's also got a more show with, for example, the Summer Games Fest, where indies were much more prominent because those AAA games were kind of low-key. And indie games can offer much more unique experiences, often much more creative experiences that wouldn't pass through a boardroom meeting of, we need to optimize how much money we get out of this for our shareholders. That gamers are realizing that, hey, indie games are getting better. And of course, there's still a big difference. Like, a lot of players go for the mainstream indie games and not always the most more like vague and obscure indie games, but still more and more people are interested in it. You have the option of a hey, lower development overhead because it's like one, two or three people often just work on an indie game, quicker release cycles and lower pricing, which means your games will appeal to more people in general. So don't be scared of just looking at all of the layoff data and being like, hey, there's no way I'm going to survive here. If you're considering getting started in AAA game dev and not indie, it's going to be a bit harder. I have to be honest there, it's going to be really rough right now. But indie development is easier than ever. Yes, there's more competition, but just make a good game, right? That's what you guys always say in the comments. But in all seriousness, it is still very much doable to release games and make a profit, even if you're a solo developer competing with all of those other games. So if you want to learn more about how do I make this game start from start to finish and all of that stuff, then be sure to go ahead down below and subscribe because we upload two videos every week talking about our game dev experiences, the things we learn along the way and all of that, like give you an industry insider perspective into game development. So once again, if that's something you're interested in, head down below and subscribe. It really helps us out. Only 38% of the people who watch our videos are actually subscribed. So if you could do me a favor, it just makes me happy at the end of the day. Anyways, that's already to say. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.